Public Affairs Forum. I'm Jim Zarin, President of City Club, and I welcome you all, those of you here at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB-FM or KBPS AM radio or watching on cable television. Thank you for joining us for this week's Friday Forum on this, the 27th of March, 2009. Today we will learn about pending changes to Oregon's initiative system, spurred in no small part by the City Club's 2008 study report on that subject. But first, I have several announcements. Uh, a consideration of those sitting close to you and those in our radio and television audiences, if you've not already done so, please turn off your cell phones or other devices that would make noise. We are pleased to welcome our three Friday Forum corporate sponsors this quarter, without whose generous financial support these time-honored City Club Friday Forum luncheons would not be possible. Our corporate sponsors for this quarter are the law firm of Schwabe, Williamson & Wyatt, Northwest Natural, and Portland General Electric. We thank them all for their support. And if you or your company or firm would like to be a City Club Friday Forum sponsor or sponsor the club's nationally renowned citizen-driven research program, please contact the club's office. Now, if you did not see it in the club's bulletin for this week, please know that Executive Director Charity Fain and I, on behalf of the Board of Governors, have put out a call to action to all City Club members, former members and friends of the organization concerning the club's financial condition during this time of difficult economic conditions. This is a rough time financially for just about everyone and just about every organization, and City Club is not immune despite its status as a 93-year-old iconic part of the civic infrastructure of this city, region, and state. Indeed, the club faces a budget deficit of $35,000 for this fiscal year ending May 31st. After tightening up the club's expenditures every way practicable during the rest of the this fiscal year, the Board of Governors is now asking for help from all who can help. As a result, the Board of Governors has identified several specific ways that those who value City Club and its contributions to this community can help the organization get through this challenging situation. First, the Board is asking all club members, if they are able, to make a special contribution of $50 now, either this month or next month. Second, the board is asking each uh, existing club member to recruit at least one new or lapsed member to join the club during the current spring membership drive. Now, I want to acknowledge that each member recruiting just one member uh, that's uh, not been a member or is a lapsed member may not seem like much of a contribution to this economic situation, but really the reality is much otherwise. If we each do our part, you can just do the math on this. The fact is, if 100 of us each recruits one, or one new or lapsed member, collectively that will result in $16,500 in new monies to the club this fiscal year. And if my math is right, that means if 213 of us would recruit one or new uh, member or lapsed member to join, that would uh, completely erase our $35,000 shortfall. So please do your part as a club member to recruit a new or lapsed member. It's a very powerful thing for us to be able to do collectively to meet this financial challenge because if many of us each do a little, it will cumulatively uh, result in a lot for the organization we all support. And please know that the club has identified ways of encouraging participation in this special spring membership drive. First, the club is waiving the one-time $25 membership fee for any new or uh, new members. Second, when a new or lapsed member uh, joins City Club during this membership drive, because of being recruited by an existing member, both the new member and the recruiter will receive a voucher for uh, admission to the City Club Friday Forum of your choice. And third, the existing club member who recruits the most new members during this drive will win a dinner for two at Nell Central, a new fine dining French-Italian restaurant due to open in downtown Portland this May. And finally, if you are with us but are not a City Club member, but you value these Friday Forum luncheons or perhaps our research uh, reports or ballot measure studies or the other programs of the club, whether you're recruited or not, please, please consider joining and in the process help this organization stay vital. Membership brochures are on your table or otherwise available uh, with the staff at the back of the room. Please take one and put it to good use. We think you'll not regret it. Uh, and don't forget that membership dues, as Ted Kay would remind us, are uh, fully tax deductible on your federal and state income tax forms. <laughs> And so take advantage of that. 
Now, as to these benefits that the club confers on its members, let me just quickly give you a sample based on what's going on at City Club just in the next few weeks. Just going to zip through these real quickly. Tonight, all are invited to the Lucky Lab Beer Hall in Northwest Portland for the club's final Friday meet and greet. It's a great chance to meet new people, share ideas, and talk about public issues of interest. On April 7th, Agora's Civics 101 program will discuss the Portland Plan, a citywide effort to guide the development of Portland during the next 30 years. On April 13th, the Bright Lights event, co-sponsored by City Club and Portland Spaces Magazine, will discuss, appropriately enough, Portland's special public spaces, such as Pioneer Square, and that's at Jimmy Max. As always, Cynthia Townsend from Agora is at the back of the room selling the Citizens Read Book Club uh, selection for, this, uh, for its next meeting, which will be on April 29th. That book is Beauty of the City, a biography of the architect A.E. Doyle, who designed some of Portland's most historic buildings. The City Club's Research Board has been seeking members for its new research committee to study the future of Forest Park, a topic just approved by the Board of Governors earlier this month. And next week here at Friday Forum, linguist Greg Anderson from Salem will describe the fascinating race to save the world's dying languages, a full half of which are projected to become extinct within the next 100 years. That's right here at the Friday Forum for next week. Now for information about these and other City Club programs, a slate of programming which I would suggest fully merits this community's ongoing financial support, please check the club's weekly bulletin or the club's website. And now to our program for today. In 2008, the City Club released a research study report approved by the club's membership, making recommendations for significant changes in Oregon's initiative system. The method of direct citizen votes on changes in state statutes in the state constitution adopted in Oregon in 1902. Since the release of the City Club study, and in no small part due to the sustained efforts of the club's awareness and advocacy committee charged with seeking of recommendations of the club's report, those recommendations improving Oregon's initiative system have taken root. In fact, there are several bills pending on the subject in the legislature in Salem this session. Of the various recommendations made by the club being considered in Salem, two are, are of most noteworthiness. First, the proposal to shift to a form of so-called indirect initiative under which, essentially, the legislature is given an opportunity to enact the proposed change before it is sent to the voters. The second significant club recommendation being addressed in the state capitol is the proposal to limit the subject matter of initiatives proposing amendments to the state constitution. So what will happen to all of these ideas and all of these bills in the legislature? Will the club's recommendations be adopted? What can Oregon learn from the initiative systems of other states? Will our, what are the political factors at play regarding all of this in Salem? And how would adoption of these changes uh, change Oregon politics? Well, we are fortunate to have a panel with expertise and perspectives on these questions, and I am pleased to introduce them now. Our first speaker is Dr. Melody Rose, Chair of the Division of Political Science at Portland State University. Melody Rose has a Master of Public Affairs, a Master of Arts in Government, and a PhD in Government from Cornell University. She has authored many books, articles, and chapters on social and election policy. She's a regular analyst in the media on matters of elections, voting, and women's political action. And in addition to all of this, as many of you know, Melody Rose serves as the Chair of the City Club's Friday Forum Committee and is a member of the Board of Governors. We are pleased to have her as a panelist at today's Friday Forum, albeit wearing her professor hat rather than her city club hat. We, uh, she will address what Oregonians can learn from the initiative systems in other states. Today's second speaker is Ryan Deckert. Since 2007, Ryan Deckert has been president of the Oregon Business Association. OBA, formed by business leaders in 1999, aims uh, to provide bipartisan statewide business leadership to ensure Oregon's long-term economic competitiveness. Before joining OBA, Ryan Deckert represented Washington County for two terms as a member of the Oregon House of Representatives before being elected twice as a member of the Oregon State Senate, where, among other provision, uh, positions, he served as chair of the Senate Revenue Committee. Ryan will explain why a coalition of business, labor, and government reform groups is supporting initiative change in Salem this session. Our final speaker is Representative Larry Galizio, who is serving in his third term representing Oregon House District 35 in Washington and a little bit of Mul Multnomah County. Larry Galizio also has taught at Portland Community College for 15 years, where he transformed the college's speech and de debate team into an internationally recognized program. 
Representative Galizio has been playing a key role in the initiative discussion in Salem. Along with Senator Frank Morris, he is spearheading the effort to establish the indirect initiative in Oregon. Uh, Larry Galizio will discuss how adoption of the indirect initiative could restore integrity to Oregon's initiative system while enhancing voter choice. Our speakers will speak in the order in which I've introduced them, and we've asked them to each speak for no more than 10 minutes, for a total of 30 minutes, uh, so we will have at least 15 minutes at the end for questions before we adjourn at 1.15. So please welcome our distinguished panel for today, Dr. Melody Rose, Ryan Deckert, and Representative Larry Galizio. Thank you, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. More than 200 years ago, writing under the pen name Publius, the great constitutional dreamer and future US President James Madison wrote a treatise for the American form of government known as Republican, with a small r, or representative government. Madison and his fellow founders crafted the Republican form of government which is codified in Article 4 of the U.S. Constitution in response to two great evils, monarchs and the masses. The evils of monarchs are well known and not relevant to our topic today. The masses, however, most certainly are. Madison was concerned for what he termed the mischiefs of faction, which he considered to be a natural offshoot of any society constituted a free citizens. In his view, a faction could be any group of people, whether in the majority or in the minority, who attempts to use government to advance an interest outside the public good. The only cure for faction, Madison warned, was the Republican form of government, which would remove from the masses the power to directly make laws, but retain their voice in the selection of representatives. A representative government, elevated from the masses, could deliberate, amend, and persuade until the public good becomes public policy. Almost to a person, the founders feared direct democracy. Alexander Hamilton, who was best known for his own personal ambition and thankfully for never having been president, summed it up this way. The people are turbulent and changing. They seldom judge, or determine right. By the end of the 19th century, however, impulses toward wider democratic participation had produced greater voting rights and a healthy distrust for political power. The populist and progressive movements of the turn of the 20th century focused their ire specifically on the power of political parties, at that time well known for their corruption at the ballot box. This is the period of American history that produced the slogan, vote early, vote often, after all. Whenever you get more than 100% turnout, you have good reason to suspect the parties. In response to entrenched partisan control over government, populist farmers joined forces with progressive elites, doctors, lawyers, professors, journalists, clergy, people like us, and sought a series of electoral changes that would wrest government power away from the political parties. Included among these reforms was the initiative. The initiative system was designed to empower the people by affording them the right to make laws outside the legislature. In order to bring about laws that the legislature either can't or won't make, the initiative system provides citizens with a form of direct democracy which is ironically fundamentally anathema to our Republican form of government. Instead, the initiative system draws from different philosophical roots. It calls upon our libertarian streak, as well as our populist impulses. It also entails a healthy dose of cynicism and distrust of government. Democracy expert Benjamin Barber explains it this way. If Americans sometimes seem unfit to legislate, it may be because they have for so long been passive observers of government. The remedy is not to continue to exclude them from government, but rather to provide practical and active forms of civic education that will make them more fit than they were. Initiative and referendum processes are ideal instruments of civic education. As a consequence of the progressive movement, the initiative system often incorrectly thought to have originated here in Oregon. 
extends today to 24 states. Oregon adopted the initiative in 1902, and it swept across the West from here. A century later, we are here to consider the impact of the Oregon initiative system. While most Oregonians report liking the system, recent polling has also revealed that they are interested in reforming it. What are the concerns? Many concerns stem from the fact that Oregon's particular set of initiatives guidelines is more permissive than those of other states. And as a result, Oregon has witnessed a prolific use of its initiative. A review of our initiative's provisions, for instance, reveals that it's extremely easy to qualify for the Oregon ballot. Petitioners here need only to present valid signatures equaling 8% of the votes cast in the preceding gubernatorial election for constitutional changes and 6% for statutory ones. Very few states have such a low threshold and only one to date has a lower threshold. In Oregon, we provide virtually no limits on the content of the measures that can come before us. They can be constitutional or statutory, uh, whereas many states other than Oregon limit uh, their initiative process to exclusively statutory measures. They can deal with any subject matter and, as we've seen here in Oregon, the subject matter may come to us again and again and again. They can also affect revenues and taxes, as we well know, and we have no requirement that the signatures coming in represent geographic distributional equity. In Oregon, we also have very little input from any branch of government in our practice of direct democracy. We provide a direct initiative system without legislative input or advisory opinions from the judiciary regarding constitutionality. As a consequence of our very inclusive initiative practices, David Broder of the Washington Post warns that we have created laws without government. The advantage of Republican government is exactly its deliberative quality. When making public policy, the legislature can call for public testimony, gather expert advice, and debate alternatives, all of which frequently leads to amendments. It may be that our use of direct democracy actually prevents Republican government from working effectively. By committing the elected bodies of government to particular revenue restrictions or programmatic expenditures without the requisite trade-offs, the initiative system makes it difficult for Republican government to actually work, which ironically leads to either further levels of citizen distrust of our government officials. A lesser understood consequence of Oregonians' prolific use of the initiative system is the financial uncertainty our direct democracy produces. Because initiatives in Oregon can commit the state to expenditures without identifying the source of those monies or alternatively limit revenue streams, Oregon's financial stability is viewed as weak. That instability translates into Oregon receiving lower bond ratings than many other states, and as a result of weaker bond ratings, our ability to finance public works projects is hindered and we are fo forced to pay higher interest rates when we do issue bonds. The initiative imposes other costs as well. Through a process known as ballot title shopping, petitioners frequently submit multiple versions, almost identical, of the same concept and shop for a title most beneficial to their cause. This practice imposes a real cost on our court system in particular at a time when state budgets are extremely strained. We might also note that our ability to craft constitutional reforms through direct democracy has cluttered the Oregon Constitution. Through the initiatives process, our Constitution is now filled with numerous matters not related to government structures or civil liberties. Fraud is also an issue. Earlier this week, the Oregonian reported that Secretary of State Brown is pursuing reforms aimed at eliminating fraud associated with signature gathering during the initiative's process. Content is also a concern. Voter guide statements don't have to be true. Advocates only need to pay to print them. Furthermore, ballot measures don't have to be constitutional, 
and often need to be amended through legislative action in order to be administered. To use the, a common phrase in this last election cycle, it sounds a bit like putting lipstick on a pig. Finally, two modern considerations. Sometimes the initiative system isn't used with the object of actually changing public policy here in Oregon. So I'll note two ways in which this appears. First, because it is relatively inexpensive to get on the ballot in Oregon, outside interests will occasionally test market their ideas here in Oregon where their real intent is passage in other states. Alternatively, my own research has indicated that provocative social issue initiatives are used often to drum up electoral turnout of particular voting box as witnessed in 2004 and 2006 across the country. As a result of similar concerns in other states, a number of states have considered reform of their initiative systems. Since 2000, the National Conference of State Legislators estimates that there have been nearly 200 reform bills nationally per biennium. The reforms include things like subject restrictions, elimination of constitutional options, raising the number of signatures required to get on the ballot, compressing the time period during which those signatures may be gathered, and shifting to a form of indirect initiatives, which provides for legislative and or judicial input. The City Club of Portland has embraced a number of these reform suggestions, and there are, as Jim mentioned, a host of bills being pre presented in the legislature this session. Oregonians appreciate the opportunity to participate in the initiative system. It's clear that Oregonians like direct democracy, but numerous reports, including two major studies conducted by this club, have outlined some encumbrances of the system. So we've come to the question, how do we make the initiative system work? Can we have direct democracy without undermining our Republican form of deliberative government? To answer these questions, I'll yield the mic to my fellow panelists. So, you know, I should never follow and remind me to do this in the future, Jim, a doctor of political science because she just, uh, Representative Glazy and I were talking, she just outlined the entire case uh, for restoring integrity to our initiative system. So perhaps what I'll do with my, and I'll keep my comments relatively brief, is give you a few anecdotes that drove us to the moment that we're at, which I think this state is on the precipice of enacting major reforms, thoughtful reforms, and it actually it's rare that you get to say this, as we speak, uh, they're being debated and, and heard and vetted down in, down in Salem. The moment that we came to this, uh, and uh, speaking for the business community, is we were sitting in a room, and I think, that's, is, I think it's Jerry Carruthers here seated at the front table. We were seated, we were together with a coalition of business and the leading businesses in the state and the leading labor groups in the state about a year ago today and we're sitting around the group's name, we had titled ourselves Defend Oregon, all around defeating another batch of initiatives. And our main charge, frankly, was to raise 10 to $14 million, largely the, the labor unions who were on the front lines were l largely, but business certainly was um, dedicated to, to raising a significant chunk of money to defeat. And here was the key, the same initiatives for the third time and sometimes fourth time that Oregonians had voted on. And so you can imagine it does not take you long to sit around a 15 to 20 person table and say, this is nuts. That we are every two years, largely because of two individuals who had figured out a way, as, as Dr. Rose mentioned, to ensure that their issues for different reasons, no real intention of actually waging a campaign on behalf of the initiative, but largely to cause that group to have to come together and raise, this time around it was about $14 million to defeat every single one of the initiatives yet again. Um, 
it was at that moment that I think we looked around and certainly Oregon Business Association and said this is no way to run a representative democracy and that's where this came in handy. Uh, at the very same time, you, the City Club, had done an exhaustive research project on citizen initiative and had a playbook of possible reforms that, that could be entertained and enacted. And it, as you can imagine, it did not take that group long. And our job really was to rally the business, labor, good government groups together into a strong coalition of just about everyone uh, from the League of Women Voters to the largest companies in the state to um, I think all the major labor organizations to say we ought to have a mend it, don't end it uh, approach to the initiative system and that's where we get today. Uh, I think you will see a very strong effort around three different areas. Um, the first is fraud. Uh, Ted Blazak, who's, I think, who's seated over here, is, is perhaps the only person I know in the state. He has a signature gathering business that is actually trying to follow the rules uh, of the state of Oregon in terms of the laws that we have on the books. And I can tell you, my one experience of being involved in the open primary effort, if you ever want to see the lack of citizen and citizen initiative, next initiative cycle, go out onto the streets and watch for just 20 to 30 minutes the signature gathering process. It is, Ted, I think you might even agree, it is near criminal in terms of how these signatures and the way that folks gather the signatures. And the one example I will never forget, it's burned into my head, is we were trying to gather for the open primary 100 to 120,000 signatures and an individual showed up to me with about 5,000 signatures in his hand. And the rule, obviously, is, is that, and then we have a, many rules, but you can't pay for signatures. Um, so that was a, just a blatant felony violation of Oregon law, but it gave me a little insight into what happens on the street as folks gather these signatures, is that you would have folks showing up n knowing that we needed signatures and we wanted, that was tempting to have 5,000 signatures. Um, but it was that type of activity that is out there. And so I think you'll see a comprehensive package around just the fraudulent collection of signatures that hoist these measures onto the ballot before Oregonians. Oftentimes, you're voting on the same thing over and over and over again. The second two areas are in terms of cautionary ballot language, which Representative Galizio and Senator Morse have been a real leader on. Um, oftentimes, when we vote on these, they are really half choices. Do we want to? Uh, incarcerate more Oregonians. Uh, Oregonians' response has been uniformly almost yes, um, but the other part of that equation has not been the question of, and would you like to, in a no new revenue environment, take almost dollar for dollar, in, this, in the case of Oregon, funds out of your higher education and post-secondary budget to do that. And so uh, we would like to have cautionary le uh, ballot title language on the ballot so voters at least know the full choice of what they're doing when they cast a ballot to uh, build a couple more prisons, we, should, we ought to know also that there's no revenue source identified and here's the state budget. We lo the state largely does three things, education, health care, and incarceration. And so you, you have to play within that framework. Uh, the third area that is certainly teed up and ready to go is the indirect initiative. And I will tell you, as messy as it is in Salem, and one only needs to go to the Capitol, and I see several ex-legislators in the audience to know that it is, what did Winston Churchill, what's his famous, I know of watching representative democracy, I know of no worse system ever, except all the other alternatives. Uh, and representative democracy is, is just that, it is the messiest form of self-governance, but it works. Uh, it often defeats, but it's set up to defeat ideas, but at least you have all the parties sitting at a table in a deliberative process debating and negotiating, and that's where indirect initiative, the style that Washington has, at least puts your representatives back into the room in terms of the initiative system. And so we've taken that mended, don't end it approach. Um, certainly if you look at citizens' right to petition, Oregon was the first state to have direct elections of U.S. Senators through the initiative process. We guaranteed women's right to vote through the initiative process, and so certainly you would not want to end that citizen right to check government, but if, I think one only needs to look at the 
current environment that we're in to say that major reforms are probably needed and, and need to happen this session. Thank you very much for having me, and I will hand it over to uh, Representative Galizio. Good afternoon. I want to first thank the City Club for the report. I have two reports now. I have the 1996 report, I believe, and then the, the more recent report. Some things have changed. Dr. Rose, I think, mentioned the ballot title shopping. And as you probably know, in the 2007 legislative session, we did pass, we increased the number of signatures required to trigger the process to uh, get a ballot title. So it used to be you only needed 25 signatures to trigger the process for obtaining a ballot title. Now you have to reach, uh, you have to get 1,000 signatures. Uh, so it's not going to completely change that, but I do think to some degree it's, it's going to be helpful, and we'll see uh, in the next coming years how, how effective that is. So wh what I'd like to do is, well, first I want to tell a little story. Uh, so I'm the chief co-sponsor of the indirect initiative along with Senator Frank Morse, a Republican from Albany. So we like, to, we like the idea that we have a Democratic legislator from the House and a Republican senator who are chief co-sponsors of the indirect initiative. So Senator Morse and myself were invited by Don McIntyre to a lovely gathering he said, would you care to come to the executive club meeting and have a discussion about your proposal? The executive club, sure. So we went to the executive club. This is about a month and a half ago or a month ago. I can't remember, but I still have the bruises. And we proceeded to, we were on a panel, myself and Senator Morse, with uh, Ross Day, who's an attorney, and uh, Dan Meek, also an attorney left and right of the spectrum. And as you know, those who are strong, the strongest advocates of the initiative system are very passionate about it, and I, I think that's a great thing. So we went to this meeting of the executive club, there were probably about 50 people, and we tried to describe the initiative, but it became very clear that our understanding of the status quo and the crowd's understanding did I say crowd or mob? The crowd's understanding of the uh, status quo is wholly different. We were, we represented the tyrannical government in Salem that is seeking to usurp any power that the citizenry might have. The, according to this crowd, the Oregon legislature is this body of nobles who are not noble, who are unreachable, and are tyrannical by nature and are seeking nothing but a power grab. So we were yelled at. There was almost a fist fight. Uh, and Senator Morse turned to me and he said, I have never in my life experienced anything like we just did. So the passions are very high. And it's a very, uh, which that's a good thing, but I think we can, as Ryan Deckard said, our approach for the indirect initiative is mend it, not end it. So what I'd like to, to do is describe how the indirect initiative works. Uh, the qualification phase is essentially the same. The 6% for statutory, 6% uh, of the last gubernatorial election, 8% for constitutional. Everything that exists in the status quo to qualify a petition for the ballot would remain the same. What's, what's different is once you achieve the particular number of signatures to qualify for the ballot, the proposed initiative would go to the legislature and it would have to be there by the very first day of the legislative session. The presiding officers would then send the measures to the relevant committees in both the House and the Senate. So for example, if it were a land use, a proposed initiative concerning land use, it would go to the Senate Land Use Committee and the House Land Use Committee. And 
there would be hearings, at least a minimum of one hearing, public testimony, invited testimony. And this is where the deliberative democracy element comes in. Difficult questions would be asked as they are in committee. Chief petitioners and advocates would be forced to articulate the reasons for the initiative, answer the difficult questions, and the back and forth that exists in the legislative process. And of course, we know that the legislative process is slow uh, very purposefully because when you're, make, when you're enacting policy changes that can have enormous consequences, it's preferable to have a slower process. So that's what would happen. It would go to the relevant committees and there would be a deliberative discussion. And one thing I like about this, in addition to the opportunity to raise issues and have a, a more deliberative and I hope substantive debate, perhaps you'd get some good coverage in the newspaper and maybe on the radio or it would stimulate more conversation, maybe issues would be raised. I think that's always a good thing. Additionally, uh, for the campaigns, it would provide videotape of people on either side answering questions. And of course, you could consultants are very good at playing around with that, but again, you would, it would bring people, I think, out of the shadows and force them to actually respond to the difficult questions. At that point, one of three things would happen. Number one is if the idea is perceived as a good idea by members of the legislature, they can adopt it, craft a bill, and pass it. So instead of waiting until the next election, the idea that comes from the people is then adopted by the legislature. And of course the chief petitioner, once he or she had the measure adopted, would be able to pull it from the ballot. So that's one option. Another option is the legislature could, in effect, take no action. If the legislature thought that, well, we don't, you know, people don't like this idea in particular, in particular but we don't see it as horribly uh, consequential in terms of having negative consequences, they might take no action, and the chief petitioner would, of course, take it to the ballot and all voters would vote on it. So in a sense, it would almost be the same process except it would have the, those hearings. The third element of it, and this is a part that I think, uh, I hope I can do a good job of explaining this, but if the legislature believes that this idea is problematic, the legislature can do what it did in the last election with, you probably remember, the Kevin Mannix ballot measure 61, having to do with increasing mandatory minimum sentences for property crimes. So let's say that that proposal comes to the legislature and the legislature sees that that's gonna cost hundreds of millions of dollars, it's gonna take money away from education, public safety, and uh, human services. What the legislature could do is put forth a legislative referral, as we can do in the status quo. But here's one difference. Both the proposed initiative and the legislative referral would be grouped on the ballot. And this might have happened to you. This happened to me and a lot of people in, that I talked to were very frustrated that here was ballot measure 61, they didn't like it. Here was ballot measure 57, the referral, they didn't like it. However, they were told that measure 61 is going to pass, so you need to vote for the lesser of two evils. So there were a lot of people holding their nose voting for measure 57. And lo and behold, we're now, we have measure 57. What the indirect initiative proposal will do is the proposed initiative will come to the legislature and go to the ballot. And let me give an example, actually, it's probably easier if I give an example. So let's say that there's a proposed initiative to change the wording on the Made in Oregon sign. And it would read, how do I get to Cesar Chavez Boulevard? So this is the proposed initiative. So it comes to the legislature, I don't know what committee it would go to, but it would come to the legislature and 
let's say that the, the legislative advisory vote was not to adopt it, people didn't like it, and they were concerned. So the legislature does a referral, an alternative proposal dealing with the same issue. So let's say the legislature decides that we want to change the wording of the Made in Oregon sign to keep Portland weird. So you would have these competing initiatives on the ballot. You would have the, how do I get to Cesar Chavez Boulevard and keep Portland weird? They would be grouped and you would have the following option. First, you could choose to vote no on both. In other words, I don't like either of these. And that would be my recommendation, by the way, for what it's worth. Uh, you could vote no for both. However, you would then make a second vote, which is the lesser of two evils, which in effect is saying, in the event that the voters decide to vote in a majority yes for both proposals, I prefer keep Portland weird, or I prefer, how do I get to Cesar Chavez Boulevard? So that would allow you to vote no on both, yet at the same time you have the fallback position to articulate your preference. Really quickly, what I see in terms of the values that kind of undergird this init uh, indirect initiative proposal, uh, number one is I think it's increased deliberative democracy. You have an opportunity to have a more substantive debate because you'll have people who have to answer questions in committee, difficult questions, you still have public testimony. So I think that's really a very important part of the process as opposed to the status quo where we, all we have are dueling advertisements. And we'd still have that, but I think you would get that kind of deliberative discussion. Secondly, I think there would be increased transparency uh, regarding both the opponents and the proponents of the measures. In other words, you would see who's testifying for, who's testifying against. They would be on tape, and so you bring people out of the shadows. Third, I think it overall would increase accountability and responsibility for chief petitioners and for the legislature because of, because of those hearing, hearings, greater ownership of ideas. You know, the status quo works really well for people who make a living now in the signature gathering or it's the, certainly it's the full employment act for political consultants. It doesn't help Oregonians. I think the indirect initiative will not solve all the problems, but I think it is a fantastic improvement and I hope uh, your consideration is, um, you, you give it your consideration. I do want to thank the City Club for the report and thank you for being here today. The first question of our speakers is always to be from our Board of Governors host. Our host today is Ted Kay. Ted Kay is Vice President for Finance at Teledirect International here in Portland. City Club member since 1990. Ted received uh, the City Club President's Award in 1908. He is the club's treasurer and chair of the finance committee and is a member of the club's development committee, membership committee, strategic planning steering committee, and governance task force. Ted's busy. Uh, he has served as a member of the Board of Governors since 2007. Ted? Thank you, Jim. 100 years ago, Oregon adopted the initiative system in part in response to a corrupt or ineffective legislature. Today, some people assert that Oregon sees so many initiatives because the legislature isn't doing its job fully. That is, there would be fewer initiatives if the legislature would get out in front of the public and act. Would each of you please comment on that? Ladies first, I guess. Um, Oregon has the most prolific record of initiatives of any state in the nation. And typically California and Colorado are nipping at our heels close behind. I guess I would say, Ted, that there are a couple of forces at play that cause Oregon to be a leader, uh, if you will, in, in the use of the initiative system. One is that we have a very low threshold. So part of the reason that the initiative is used so frequently is the rules of the game. So frequently the rules of the game dictate the outcome of the game. So that's 
uh, I think, cause number one. Uh, but to your point, it is important to recognize that one of the things that distinguishes Oregon from many of the other states that use the initiative process with any frequency is our part-time legislature. And I think that those two facts are very closely tied to one another, and I'm not sure which is the chicken and which is the egg, um, but we have to appreciate that when our legislature is called to session for six months every other year, it is not operating at a full-time professional level the way that the California legislature is, for instance. So it, I think it stands to reason um, that we would be looking at our other political institutions to understand our practice of, of usage here. Oh, so I'll be, re you know, I'm out of political life, so I'm free to say whatever I want to, and I don't have the academic ri rigor of, uh, of a professor, so I'll be just really blunt. A couple of individuals have figured out, and if you look at what we voted on in the last decade, it's really two or three people have figured out how to use these very lax and easy rules to put a, a few ideas and regurgitate and resuscitate and repackage the same type of ideas on the ballot over and over and over again. And that's where we finally uh, have said, uh, along with, with, with the City Club's report and Courageous Legislators is enough of having a few people dominate the civic discourse in the state of Oregon. Uh, we gotta tighten up the rules and make it at least a little bit more difficult and, and less disingenuous about what they're doing. Uh, I'm probably one of the one of probably the only legislator who's not running for governor in 2010, so I could say whatever I want it too. <laughs> you know, in the th this is why the proposal is is mend it, not end it. I think there are times when the legislature does fail to act, and that the initiative can provide a means to say, you know, it's it's called the gun behind the door. At the same time, I don't know that there are people crying out in Portland for so-called paycheck deception, as some call it. Some of the initiatives, obviously, are more about the agenda of, of very well organized and very well financed interest groups that I don't know that they necessarily represent the will of, of, of the people of Oregon, and that is articulated or expressed in the fact that these continue to, to go down in flames on the ballot. The, the reality is Oregon, because of, as Dr. Rose articulated, because we are, we have a relatively low threshold, Oregon is a guinea pig for organized, wealthy, national interests who have, in a sense, colonized Oregon's initiative system to see whether or not they want to roll out and, and spend more of their resources in other states for similar policy kinds of ideas. Now is the time for <clears throat> questions from the floor. Uh, asking questions of City Club Fire Reform is a privilege of City Club membership, so please uh, introduce yourself as a City Club member. Keep your question to 30 seconds or less. A uh, member has a question mark at the end, and you can address your question to one or all three or two of the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Susan Matthes, a City Club member. Uh, I was, I'm, perhaps I didn't hear the whole thing, or you didn't express the whole thing, but I was really surprised that the direct initiative, or the direct ref, uh, indirect uh, referendum initiative, doesn't address any of the things that make it too easy in Oregon to get on the ballot. I mean, that's very disappointing, and how does that fit into Secretary of State Brown's effort to increase the number of signatures that are needed? Seems to me a very wise idea. Uh, why isn't the legislature addressing the need to make it more difficult? That it, so that's one part of the, it is a package. Um, and there's several components of the package. There's the fraud piece, the ballot title piece, and the signature piece. And what I think you'll see is a package of reforms and then um, the indirect that, that many of us are working on and Representative Glazio is sponsoring. And, and uh, Susan, I, I think another reason is quite frankly that probably the people, a lot of the people in this room are in the minority. In other words, once the legislature, the tyrannical, dysfunctional Oregon legislature 
attempts to put more barriers up. It's the people of Oregon versus the tyrannical politicians, and we lose that every single time. B.J. Seymour, City Club member. It was brought out that some things show up on the ballot over and over again. I'd like to ask all three of the panelists, do you think this one will pass on the first try? With your help, <laughs> I hope so. I mean, honestly, number one, we have to get it out of the building and it's a hard vote for legislators to do anything to the initiative process. And then, because it's a constitutional change, it would go to the people. And if there are any people who feel strongly about the indirect initiative and want to support it, then we need to form a PAC and run a campaign. And I need money, or we need money. So. I, I would just add um, that if the thing does get out of the building, uh, and we are all as citizens considering this proposal that we look to the, I think it's now 11 states that use the indirect initiatives process to understand what we're voting for. Because I think oftentimes when we're talking about a government structure reform, uh, I would agree with Representative Galizio that not only uh, will there be folks who are suspicious of that effort because of its origins, um, but I also think that there are many who are cautious and conservative about changing any governmental structure, particularly when it has to do with the vote. So in that case, I think the best thing that we could do as consumers of the ballot measures would be to look at those 11 states and understand how the system works in those states and understand what those best practices look like. Chris Smith, City Club member. Uh, I think one of the things that upsets me about the current practice of the initiative system the most is that it essentially uh, sells off the political agenda to the highest bidder. You know, we will talk about in a given election what somebody with a lot of money has decided we're going to talk about by writing a check. Um, I know you're not addressing that. I know that Oregon's freedom of expression clause is one of the reasons it's very difficult for us to deal with that here in Oregon. But perhaps uh, Dr. Rose can share whether there have been uh, attempts in other states to get at the financial underpinnings of abuse of the initiative system uh, with finance regulations or, or anything along those lines? Well, what I would say is that there are a number of ways to get at those concerns, Chris, and um, campaign finance regulations are only one of them. Uh, the other way to get at the concerns about the content of what appears on the ballot can sometimes have to do with advisory opinions from the judiciary. So there are a number of states, and this also is, a, uh, is a, a matter of structure and how we interpret the role of the Oregon judiciary. There's a fairly lively debate in Oregon about whether or not the judiciary should be permitted to offer advisory opinions, which w would, I think, indirectly get to your concern because we could have an assessment if the judiciary here in Oregon were allowed to offer advisory opinions, we could get an assessment of constitutionality, uh, of functionality, of what was being pr proposed for the ballot. Um, and there are other states that use their judiciary in that manner. So yes, we could get at it through uh, campaign finance law, but we could also get at this question through other mechanisms as well. And the other one, of course, has to do with the literature that we receive as voters in, in the um, voter's guide. So that's another change that could be very beneficial to the civic discourse around the topics. So because those statements don't actually have to be true, not only do we sometimes have others hijacking the political agenda, but the content of the agenda does not necessarily come to us factually correct. So that's another set of reforms that might indirectly get at the source of your worry. My name is Richard Bateri. I'm a member of the City Club. I practiced election law for about 25 years, including in this area. I also have a master's degree in Oregon legal history, in which I wrote about 19th century voting laws. Your indictments of the, of the initiative are correct. Your suggestions for improving it, I think, are somewhat naive. 
which only reinforced my opinion that there is no election law reform measure that a good lawyer can't figure out the way around if you gave him 15 minutes to think about it. And uh, 20 years ago, I was testifying before a city club committee in which I was asked what I would suggest, and I said that at that time, get rid of it, and that I would like you people to think about, once again, instead of wandering down all these areas, as you really begin to think about organizing an effort to get rid of it. Thank you. You know, I'd only suggest, because I have seen polling on this, that the number of claps you heard is about the number of Oregonians that are receptive to that idea. Uh, and that's part of the, the challenge. And, and they're now open for the first time to rethinking, because they've seen it played out. But the receptivity to anyone, but I'll just count, pick on Larry and myself, hoisting that on Oregonians would be met by about those few smattering of applause. But it also should be pointed out that 26 states managed to get by without it. Uh, I'm Mike Burton, member of the City Club, and also a member of the Oregon Criminal Justice Commission, and watched ballot measure 57 being drafted by the legislature. And talk about sausage. The alternative, the legislature turned out, was almost as bad as, the, as Mannix initiative. And I think that speaks to the problem that we're in with this. I do like, Representative Galuzio, your idea of grouping the ballot measures but I, it was two things that I didn't hear. One was, is there an opportunity for judicial review, what uh, uh, Melody brought up in that process you're talking about for indirect. And secondly, I'm a little bit confused about why you're giving me, if I had this system, that second uh, voting choice. If I, I can vote no or I can vote yes, why do I want to vote maybe? Which is the way I heard it. Maybe I misunderstood. Sure. I mean, first on the judicial review, one, I, you know, the hope and the idea behind bringing it to a committee in the legislature is constitutional questions would then be raised and perhaps at that point wouldn't have to go to the ballot because it's unconstitutional and it's problematic, which, I mean, right now the courts are cluttered with bad initiatives. So that's part of the, the idea behind the indirect initiative. And then the, re the reason for the, the, the setup the way it is is because, yes, you'd vote no on both, However, in the event that others in the state, a majority, decide that they, wanna, they support both of those, you have the option, you don't have to do it, you have the option of voting, saying this is the lesser of the two evils. It's not a perfect uh, system, but that's the idea behind it. Leslie Moorhead, City Club member, and I was the research advisor to the Initiative and Referendum Committee that published the report that you've all been so complimentary about, so thank you for your compliments. I have two questions, and Representative Galizio, if you'd answer these first and the others can weigh in, we'd like to hear your opinions too. Um, first of all, one of the arguments against the indirect initiative is that it will slow down the process. And could you, based on the wording of the bill as you know it, speak to the timing of when the, a ballot measure would end up on the ballot if, in fact, it's going to, um, based on the timing that, that is the case now. Second question is, we heard in our committee research from so many legislators that there's really no need to compromise on controversial issues. I'm thinking of social policy issues primarily, but other things too, taxation and so on. Legislature, legislators are always under the threat of, well, we'll take it to the ballot anyway. The citizens who want to propose something that might be very controversial or even damaging to the state would be, would be able to say, well, we'll take it to the ballot anyway, so there won't be any way to compromise. I don't see how the proposed indirect initiative as you have it solves that problem. Um, so the first part on the s slowing down the process, it does slow it down, and that is one of the major criticisms. Uh, but as Cicero said, it's better that a good measure should fail than a bad one should pass. It's purposefully slow, and when we're making major changes, like Measure 47 or Measure 5, it should be slow. So I'll be, uh, I think it is, it does slow things down, and that's a good thing, I, I would argue. But again, it would, it would, instead of going directly to the ballot, it would first go to the legislature, and then for the following election. So it would slow it down. And then uh, the second question, I'm forgetting what the second question was. The social issues and compromise. Oh, no reason to compromise. Uh, well, again, the idea is, I mean, you're right, at, at one level, if they can get the number of signatures and it's, the threat is still there, 
At the same time, if there's an opportunity to get a bill enacted immediately, um, so. Okay, we've run out of time. We have to end our questions there. Uh, please join us for next Friday's forum when we have a presentation on the race to save the world's dying languages. Please remember to grab a City Club uh, membership form on your way out and use it to recruit. Uh, and as we close, please join me in expressing our appreciation to uh, today's distinguished panel, Dr. Melly Rose, Ryan Decker, Representative Larry Galizio. We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>